You're listening to the Northfield Radio Program, where faith, family, and culture all collide with the biblical worldview. There is a war that's raging for the hearts and the minds and the spirits of men and women. And you and I, as Christians, are on the forefront of that battle. The question is, what will you do? To find out more about the Northfield Radio Program and Caleb Gordon, go to www.calebgordon.com. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Northfield Radio Program. I am so excited that you're here with us today. My name is Caleb. I am your host. As always, want to say thank you to our friends at Outpost Coffee. They have incredible caffeinated beverages. Check these guys out at outpostcoffeeco.com. All right, guys, get ready to buckle up. We have got an incredible show for you today. I have a sermon that is from Dr. Rick Rigsby from an Iron Sharpens Iron conference here in Oklahoma. I was actually in the room for this sermon and occasionally you can hear me laugh, and it is probably one of the most impactful messages to men that I have ever heard. You've got to just get ready. You're going to be blown away. I I want to talk to you all about a passage of Scripture that is really challenging me to be an authentic man of God, which happens to be my title for this Iron Sharpens Iron, being an authentic man of God. The reason why it's so important that we be an authentic man of God is because we live in a, live in a disingenuous society. We, we live in a society that is so shallow and so superficial that all we have to do is learn how to pontificate with an ecclesiastical excellence, whatever that means. That all we have to do is show up and interview well, look good, and pe- we pass muster. Even in church, all you have to do is hang out with the right folks. Go to lunch with the right people whoever they are. Make sure you vote Republican. (laughs) All you have to do is make sure that the outside of the cup is well manicured and it gives you license to act like hell the rest of the week. Just keep looking straight ahead like I'm not talking to you. Just keep looking straight. Just, Just nod like, you know, you understand what I'm saying. We live in a society that places very little responsibility on us. I was on a coaching staff for quite a few years. In fact, it's so nice to come to Oklahoma and not get beat. But anyway, uh, <laughs> good Lord. And if, and, and if, if, if getting beat in, 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 uh, in Norman wasn't bad enough, then the last few years we've been getting beat in Stillwater. We dare not come to Tulsa. No telling what would happen. But being on that coaching staff, it was really interesting. Watch this, y'all. Say, I'm listening, man. I'm listening. Every one of you now, say, I'm listening, sir. Say, I'm listening. I'm listening. Watch this. It was, very, it was really interesting to finish a football game. And we'd be flying home from Notre Dame or from Stillwater or from wherever. And we'd lose the game, say, 35, 34. Players are in the back. Coaches are up front. And invariably, on a tight loss, you would always hear this statement. Watch this. You'd hear a coach say, Man, that ref cost us a game. How many of y'all heard that? Don't raise your hands. This is a rhetorical question. How many of you have actually said that? Don't raise your hand. This is a rhetorical question. Boy, y'all are like Aggies, aren't you? Don't raise your hands. It's a rhetorical question. Don't. <laughs> Watch this, y'all. Watch this. And, and most of us would agree and go, yeah, that ref cost us a game. And I remember one night I was thinking this, fellas. I was thinking, you know, that's interesting. If the ref cost us the game, then how does that equate? Because we had 80-some plays on offense. We had over 70 opportunities to stop on defense. And the reality is, the ref made a bad call, but he didn't cost us the game. What are you saying to us, preacher? We live in a society where we are so far removed from the Bible that we literally allow circumstances and people to make excuses for our lack of being spiritual and walking with God. Are y'all with me now? And if we're not careful, men, we will fall right into this trap of living by the standards of a world. It says, you know what? It's, it's my boss's fault. It ain't about your boss. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. It ain't about your boss. I don't care if he's incompetent. I don't care if he's a she. That didn't make sense, but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't, it doesn't matter about, it's not about, it's about you. You know what, sir? It's about you. 
And whether or not every single day your attitude is excellent, whether or not excellence pervades you, whether or not excellence is dominant, prominent, preeminent, zenith, number one, top drawer, top shelf, central in your life, it's about you. And sir, attitude ain't everything. You got to be competent. You can have the best attitude in the world, but if you have a poor work ethic, what kind of witness are you? So attitude is real important, but be competent. It's about you. It's about me. It's not about them. Oh, can I also say one other thing? It is never about your wife. Oh, y'all don't like me now. I can tell you that. You want me to get back on that boat to Africa, that slow boat right now. It's not about your girlfriend. It's not even about your mama. It's not about your daddy that didn't hug you. It's not about the fact that some of you in here were abused. It's not about that. You know what it's about? Making a decision. Making a decision that says, I press on firmly in God's hand, here to honor and glorify him, so that I may be a visible representation of an invisible reality. What are you saying to us, preacher? That I would live every day letting my light shine in such a way that men would see my good works and glorify my Father who's in heaven. It's not about anything else but that. And when you come across a man, sir, when you come across a man that is that closely connected to Christ, that man makes an impact, makes a difference. He's a game changer. His wife calls him blessed. His children want to be like him. I'm looking for one man in Broken Arrow, one in this room, who's a game changer. Is it Jew, brother? Is it Jew? Is it Jew? Is it me? Looking for one man in here. Don't talk to me about your political affiliation. Don't talk to me about the color of your skin. Don't talk to me about how much you make. Those things are completely irrelevant. I've done three funerals in the last three months. Haven't seen one time a U-Haul behind a hearse. Those things are completely, totally irrelevant. It's about whether or not you're letting your light shine right now in such a profound way that Jesus is a showcase that's emanating out of your life. And that will only happen if the word is in your heart. Are you all with me, guys? Look up at me, fellas, for just a second. You need to really hear this. You could go the rest of your life and not be challenged this way. You could literally go to church, pay tithes, raise your hands at the appointed time, and live like hell. And in this shallow, superficial society where theistic theology seems to be relegated to the bottom of the well, according to Carl Henry and others, men are going through life unchecked. Are y'all hearing me? I said, are y'all hearing me? I don't know about you, but I need y'all. Shoulder to shoulder, iron sharpening iron. And more important than that, we need Jesus. Amen. We need to get in that word of God. I said we need to get in that word of God. And with that in mind, would y'all open up to Matthew 23? That's the scriptural foundation for this talk, being an authentic man of God. Did you bring your Bibles? If you did, that's all right. Share with somebody if you can. Matthew 23. Jesus is dealing with this very same issue, y'all. This very same issue. L look up for a second. I know you can't do two at once. I know you're not women. See, women can do two at once. Ain't that a trip? Because women use the left side of their brain and the right side. We use the left side, don't even know we got a right side. But anyway, <laughs> you do. <laughs> Just think, man, you're not as dumb as you look. It's amazing. <laughs> After you get Matthew 23, check this out. Jesus is having a similar conversation with Baptists and Nazarenes and Pentecostals. We're religious folks. What's your name, sir? John. He's having, he's having a conversation with the Johns of his day, with the religious folks who come to church. They, they even, guess what, man? What's your name? Rusty. Rusty. They even honor Jesus with their lips, but their heart is far away. Isn't that interesting? It, it, it could be 2012 if you look at Matthew 23. Y'all ready to read? Look at Matthew 23. I have the New American Standard Bible. I hope that didn't hurt anybody's feelings. Matthew 11:23. 23. I'm sorry, Matthew 23. Matthew 23, beginning with verse number 23. Jesus speaking, where he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You tithe mint and dill and cumin. And you've neglected the weight of your provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Verse 24. Ooh, look at this. You blind guides who strain out a net and swallow a camel. 
Verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside may become clean also. Verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You're like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so, you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Man, that, there's an indictment there. There is a scathing indictment. These were the learned Pharisees and Sadducees. These folks knew the law inside and out. They, they were supposed to be the religious leaders of the time. And Jesus says, you know what? On the outside, you appear righteous before men. Inside, there's all kinds of gunk inside of you. So you're walking around with whitewashed tombs, but inside there's robbery and self-indulgence, and Jesus had a powerful word for him, woe. The denotative definition of the word woe, great misfortune, sorrow. What's the master saying? When you choose to be an outside-of-the-cup Christian, worried only about your browning 12-gauge and whether or not it's shinier than your neighbor's, when you choose to only be an outside-of-the-cup Christian, wanting to make sure that your appearance is right. Great sorrow and great misfortune will follow you all the days of your life. Jesus was trying to warn them, don't be hypocritical. Don't be an outside-of-the-cup person who just focuses on making sure people like you. Guys, get over yourselves. Craig Groeschel said it best in his book, The Christian Atheist. He said, the quickest way to forget about what God thinks about you is to focus on what man thinks about you. Isn't it true, man? It is a marvelous, wonderful thing when a man reaches that age in his life where he worries less about what other people think about him and worries more about what God thinks about him. Jesus is saying, men, don't be actors. Don't be fake. Don't be atheists. Be the real deal. And it's very easy, look up, to be fake in this society. I was a television reporter for many years with a CBS affiliate in Northern California. I learned a lot. I learned that the television is on in the average American home eight hours a day. Hey, young folks, what's the number one show in the country right now? Do y'all have any idea? Number one show. American Idol. Number one show. You know what that says to me? And my family watches it. But you know what it says to me? We are just draped in narcissism in this culture. Draped in narcissism. It's all about me. It's all about us. I'm sick of preachers where it's all about us. Sick of plumbers where it's all about us. Sick of businessmen professing to be Christians. Aren't you all sick of it? Amen. I wonder why this place isn't full today. I wonder why we don't have an impact in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our homes. I'll tell you why. It's that ego that drives us. I'll say your line that you quoted me, that I said years ago. Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. That's a hallmark moment for you right there, <laughs> fellas. Can I say that one more time? Would you all mind? Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. Pride is the burden of a foolish person. And until you get over yourself, you'll never move on with God, ever. You, you, know, you know how you'll treat the Bible? You'll treat the Bible as something that you run to only in times of emergencies. That's how you'll treat the Bible. So, so if, you're not, if you're treating, can I just, can I just interrupt my own sermon? If, if, if you're treating the Bible that way, let me show you exactly what's going to happen. Watch this. If you take, for example, Ezekiel 1, 1 through 10, don't turn there, just listen. If you're treating the Bible as a distant cousin, this is where you are right now. And if you see yourself here, I got good news. You don't have to stay there. Watch this. Most people who are distant from the Bible seek their own justice. Can I just put it in a husband-wife context, y'all, for a second? Is that all right? Would y'all mind? So this is what we do. Honey, you told me you were going to fill up the car. You said you were going to fill up the car. Now, I'm sick and tired of getting in the car, and the car is always on empty. You said you were going to fill up the car. Now, I, I don't like it, and maybe I need to do something about it. Maybe I need to buy you a car that, that contains, uh, 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 that, that's lesser value. 
Maybe, maybe I need to, to, to monitor your use. Maybe I need to do something. I need to do something to change the situation. What's my point? If you're not reading the Word of God, you are administering your own justice. Guess what that leads to? Bitterness. So now we have justice, administering your own justice, which leads to you being a bitter person. So you walk around the house going like this. I can't believe it. She's just like her mother. I, I, I just can't believe it. Just, just pretend like you ain't never said nothing like that. I, I can't believe it. She's just like her mother. I can't believe it. Maybe it's, I, I don't know, maybe it's menopause. I don't know what it is. I just, I just can't, I, I literally can't believe it, but I'm telling you, I'm stuck. I'm, don't, don't, don't act like you never said this. I'm stuck with her. I, I'm just stuck. I guess I'm stuck. I can't divorce her. I could kill her, but I can't divorce her. But so I guess I'm stuck. I'm just stuck with her. Guess what that bitterness leads to? You start accusing God. How in the world could you do something like this? How in the world could I be in a situation like this? What are you saying to us, preacher? You want to have it your way? Go for it. But I guarantee you this, men. If you're going for it on your own way, you just found yourself either in administering justice, bitterness, or accusing God. Just nod like you know what I'm talking about in here. Y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? We have a father saying, you know what? It's not about your wife. It's not about your spouse. It's not about your boss. It's not about your preacher. It's not about church politics. If you got an issue, I got an answer. Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. What are you saying, preacher? Stop reacting to situations and be a real man of God by responding to him. Boy, that, I don't know about you. That's some good preaching, brother. Y'all are looking at me like you, you don't even know what I'm talking about. This isn't pop psychology. This isn't an opportunity for you to go out and buy tapes because it's such a popular, polished sermon. This is the word of God coming to you saying, get over it and get on with your life. Enjoy your manhood. Enjoy your position as a child of God. Stop being a fake in your family, a fake in the community, wanting folks to like you, wanting things right, wanting the situation right. Stand up and be a man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Did your mother and father raise a wimp or a man? Y'all ain't answering that one, are you? <laughs> I got anybody in here over 70 years old? Raise your hands. Back in the day, sir. There was a saying, you might be too young to remember it, but there was a saying called, play the man. Remember that saying? Guess why, young folks? Because back in the day, you kids would be going to World War I. There was no age requirement. Now, imagine mommy letting go of her 13-year-old. And so the response was, baby, play the man. In other words, you may not be a man, but act like one so that you'll start being one. In churches, I see the biggest wimps in society, in churches. In ch your Savior wasn't a wimp. I said, your Savior wasn't a wimp. Then why do you go to work a half hour late? Why are you always gossiping? Why are you always bellyaching about situations and circumstances? You have any idea who you are in Christ? Oh, y'all don't want to hear this. <laughs> Give me a bus ticket, y'all. I'm just going to go ahead and leave. Should I go on? Should, I said, should I just go on a little longer? Is that all right? So Jesus said, I'm going on anyway, so it doesn't matter. Because <laughs> as far as I know, Smokey Joe's uh, is open quite long, so I can stay here. Anyway, Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin. And you've neglected the weightier issues of the law. Huh. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. What's that mean? You major on minor stuff and minor on major stuff. Boy, he's reading my mail right now, y'all. Do you know I can talk myself into having a bad day and irritate everybody around me? I'll tell you, I'm some man of God. <laughs> Does anybody in here know what I'm talking about? I can talk my way into having a bad day. And all of a sudden, my kids are walking on eggshells. What's wrong with daddy? <laughs> are you hearing me? Jesus is saying, you know what? That's not what I'm all about. I'm about you coming to me, 
so that I can clean the inside of that cup so that you're not so insecure. You can always tell when you're around a golfer who's insecure. They'll cheat when you don't think, when they don't think you're looking. Anybody know what I'm talking about in here? Raise your hands. <laughs> you can always tell when a man is insecure. Yeah. He starts dropping names and places. Ain't that a trip? You know what I've discovered, sir? You look like a rock star, man. You got a cool kind of vibe to you. If I was white and had hair, I'd like to look like you, Big Daddy. <laughs> He's a cool looking cat right there. You, you know what I hear everywhere I go, sir? This is what I hear. I don't, people, people don't, they don't care where I've been or, or books or, or amounts. You know, what, you know what people want to know? They want to know, hey, is that Jesus really real and can he help me? Now, I got a question for you. If you all hooked up on you and you don't, you don't even recognize the new folks that have moved into your neighborhood, if it's all about you and you can't even recognize the folks that, kids, if it's all about y'all and somebody is giving you a hard time at school and all you can see is the hard time, you know what? Your focus is on the wrong place. There will always be people who laugh at you. So what? I preach and folks laugh. Are you kidding me? You think I care about that? My job is to glorify Christ the best I know how by staying in that word, not majoring on the minor, not walking around with whitewashed tombs, making sure that I am glorifying God every single day of my life. I, you know what it means? It means moving past how you feel. Do I have any preachers in here? Raise your hands, preachers. Pastor, there's some days, now the rest of you ain't going to believe this, but those of us that preach will, there's some Sundays I don't feel like preaching. Amen. You don't have to admit it. This is your church. <laughs> there's some days I don't feel like coming to preach. Sometimes. Because Christians are some crazy folks. <laughs> hmm? preach for an hour, and they got the nerve to come up and say, you had a dangling participle in the first seven minutes of the service. But God bless you, Brother Rick. <laughs> Y'all ever see the honeymooners? <laughs> Boom, pow. There's some days I don't feel like doing the work of the Lord. Where did that come from? Television endorses a certain set of feelings. Television is not just showing you sports, but it's manipulating you, and you don't even realize it. Many of you don't even know that there are eight minutes in every half hour dedicated, dedicated to the promotion of products to get you to feel insecure so that you'll buy the product. The residual effect of watching all of that television is this. We are the first society in the history of America motivated based on how we feel. Your grandparents would freak out. You know why? My mama comes from a town called Oak Muggy, Oklahoma. I know y'all don't know what I'm talking about. But my granddaddy was a peanut farmer and had some cows. I grew up in San Francisco. My mother met my father from Texas. They lived in San Francisco. I grew up there. But we would love coming to Oak Muggy. And then we would drive down the highway to Huntsville, Texas. And we would love to milk sugar and them other cows on Wednesday, and maybe on Thursday. But by Friday, getting up at 5 o'clock to milk a cow wasn't a great idea. And then all of a sudden, Grandpa is knocking on my door at 4.45 on Christmas morning. On Christmas morning. Talking about, go milk sugar. I said, Grandpa, it's Christmas. His response, cows don't know it's Christmas. <laughs> Your grandparents couldn't even relate to being motivated based on how they feel. If you don't feel like, if you don't feel like waking up early and saying, you know what, I'm just going to worship, you don't. If you don't feel like treating your boss with honor and respect, let me interrupt my own sermon and say some of y'all need to pick up watchman knees, authority and submission. If you don't feel like honoring your boss, you don't. If you don't feel like checking in and tuning in and seeing what the Lord has for you, because it's a visiting preacher, so what could he say? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. yep. That's where we are. But guess what, guys? NASCAR, Winnebago, infield, entertain Big Daddy. I'm there. 40 laps to go. We're going to postpone the race two or three times. I don't care. I'm watching that sucker. Ooh, what's that? A crash? This fool and driven into a truck and ain't going to explode? Oh, I'm scared. But he's walking away. All right. Honey, I'll be in bed later. This race is going to have a finishing point. I'll stay up all night and be entertained. I'll get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and put on some freaky deaky clothes and get a gun and meet 10 other guys at a truck stop in the middle of nowhere and go dove hunting. <laughs> I'm a black neck redneck, y'all. I'm just going to tell you right now. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'll get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, put me some granola bars in a baggie, put on some long pants and a shirt, put my Callaway clubs. Every time I say that, I get some free t-shirts. A Callaway clubs <laughs> in the back of my car and go play 18 holes. But if I don't feel like getting up, reading, hmm, Psalm 1. I don't. If I don't feel like applying Psalm 1 to my life, I don't. Psalm 1. Read it with me, brother. Just read it. Just read it. How blessed is the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. For his delight is in the law of the Lord. See there? And in that law, he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of living water, whose leaf doesn't wither, whose fruit is born in due season. And in everything that man does, he will prosper. But if I don't feel like meditating, as long as I show up and look good, how's it going, dude? That's Christian code for I have no clue what your name is. How's it going, guy? How are you, bro? That's where men are. And Jesus says, I got a word for you. Whoa, slow your roll. Just slow your roll. What are today's prophets saying? Leonard Ravenhill. How many of you have read Leonard Ravenhill? Boy, y'all need to read Leonard Ravenhill. In 1958, say 1958, y'all. In 1958, Leonard Ravenhill said, churches are a mile wide and an inch deep. What in the world would he say today, pastor? In 1958, Leonard Ravenhill said, he, he said, Christianity is at an all-time low. He said, we don't need a new definition of the gospel. What we need is a new demonstration of the power of the gospel. How about Francis Chan? How many of you read Crazy Love? Oh, watch this. How, how did this hit y'all? Francis Chan said that uh, if you're an authentic believer, the church is a difficult place to fit in. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Amen. That ought to upset you. That ought to make you say, oh God, clean my heart. Well, I'll tell you, if that didn't motivate you or that didn't encourage you or that didn't challenge you, something's wrong. You need to really examine your heart. So I'm going to promise you that. If that did not challenge your heart, you need to examine your heart. Love y'all. Have a great, great week. This program has been brought to you by DSR, a technology company that has been investing in Bartles of the Families for over 35 years. DSR, we deliver technology.